surprised when Charles Counts called this morning and said he was bringing a friend up here with him. And I might introduce the uh, uh, Charles's friend first. His name is Richard Belando. He is currently as director of the Kentucky Guild of Artists and Craftsmen. He graduated from Warren Wilson College right near Asheville, North Carolina, out in Swannanoa, which is a junior college. He then went on to Berea College for a degree in English. He is a wood craftsman. He's also a musician. So uh, I was talking with Charlie. He says he not only brought a uh, fellow craftsman, but an accompanist and a chauffeur as well who drove him up from Berea today. Mr. Belando is the instigator of what this May will be the second annual uh, crafts fair in Berea, and I think it's May 16th, May 16th through 19th. Berea is about a four hour drive from Muncie. You drive down to Cincinnati and get on the interstate and it's straight down. You can uh, stay in a very pleasant place, the Boone Tavern Inn, overnight, and you can also get some very good food in the Boone Tavern Inn. <coughs> Charles Counts is, is a very old friend of, of mine. He has uh, done a very wonderful tile mural for a church I designed down at this same uh, Warren Wilson College. Uh, for those of you in the school or anyone else who's been in the uh, office of the school, you may have seen a nice three by six or seven foot carpet hanging on the wall. He designed this, uh, this rug well, about five years ago. We also have some two very nice pieces of his pottery at home that we're convinced uh, has the texture of velvet, which is pretty hard to do in pottery anyway. Charles was born in Lynch, Harlan County, Kentucky, and received his public school education in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. From there, he went to Berea College where he became interested in ceramics as a student worker in the college pottery. Berea is a self-help school with a very heavy emphasis on crafts. He received his master's degree from Southern Illinois University in 1957, studying pottery and weaving. On the West Coast, he did further work as an apprentice with Marguerite Wildenheim and advanced work in ceramic technology and industrial design at the University of Southern California. In 1959, Charles and his wife, Rubinell, founding their own workshop near Knoxville, Tennessee, which they called Beaver Ridge Pottery. They moved their studio in 1963 and now call it the Pottery Shop at Rising Farm. It is located in a rural community on Lookout Mountain in northwest Georgia. A young man from Indiana and his wife, who studied at Ball State, are apprenticed to his uh, shop down there in Georgia. The, the young lady is, is teaching uh, reading in the, in the local mountain school. The Counts have been involved in craft training of their neighbors who were in, were in need of employment. As you know, this is Appalachia. They train two apprentices in pottery whom they currently employ. They have helped establish a community craft center which includes work in textiles, weaving, hooking, tufting, dyeing, and creative quilting. Charles is active in many regional craft activities. He's a former member of the Board of Trustees of the Southern Highland Handicraft Guild and state representative from Georgia to the American Craftsmen's Council. This year, he was appointed to the Georgia Art Commission. His work has been shown in many major regional and national craft exhibitions. 
He served as a juror of the regional interest to the 23rd and 24th Ceramics National. He has had many one-man shows throughout the country. In 1965, he won the Young American Designer Award at the Atlanta Festival of Arts. Recently, he served as a craft consultant for the Smithsonian Institution's National Collection of Fine Arts. Within the scope of this work, he toured the United States seeking and gathering professional opinion and formulating a report to advise the United States Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration. The report is entitled Encouraging American Handicrafts, What Role in Economic Development? We're very happy, I think, not only to have this, this fine exhibition of, of their work, his and Rubinell's and their associates, we're very happy to have Charles here with us tonight. Mr. Counts. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the age of the electronic media, and because they're making a tape recording, I prepared a document which I won't bore you with too long. Uh, thank you, Dean Sappenfield, for that very good introduction. That was enough, and we could all go home. Uh, <laughs> except that uh, I do have something I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first thing I did say I prepared a, a statement, and I want to get through with that as soon as possible. If I read it rapidly, it only takes 12 minutes, and if I slow down a little bit, it takes 15. Uh, then I'm getting through it uh, because I'm always misunderstood, and uh, this is written, so I, I won't say anything I really didn't know I said, and you can interpret it in various ways. <clears throat> then we're going to have a uh, slideshow, and uh, during the slideshow, I usually make comments, but uh, instead of making comments, I want you to look and uh, get very confused. And then I'll come back up on the platform and we'll turn the lights back on. And uh, what I cherish most is to have you to ask me some questions because the whole purpose of this is to evoke a response from you. And I'm already prepared and I'd like to be spontaneous. So if you'll give me a chance later to a answer questions candidly, that's what I cherish most. Uh, let me move this. What do you do with this in the School of Architecture? Hit your students over the head with it? <laughs> oh, save it for the speaker, he said. <clears throat> uh, the title of this brief statement is Comments from a Potter on American Crafts for the School of Architecture, Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana. <laughs> How's that for a beginning? Like Oliver Larkin, whose book, Art and Life in America, these words have greatly inf influenced the words that I will have to follow, I like to begin with this thought. America was an experiment. What American crafts are, we are as people. So it was when we began to develop as a country, and so it is now. In jesting, I'm mindful of the war cry, the British are coming, made by the distinguished craftsman citizen Paul Revere. Of course, culturally, the British had long been with us. So had the French and the Italians, my friend Richard Bolando tells me. The French, the Italians, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Dutch. But that's American history, and I want to, it, within a historical context, give you some of my own remarks about American craftsmanship, its past, the present scene, and the future potentialities. The internationally known potter Bernard Leach repeatedly has stated that as Americans, we suffer from the lack of tradition. As an artist craftsman, he has deeply rooted himself in the traditions of his native England and in the traditions of the Oriental potters, especially the Japanese. Others have commented on our rootlessness, our rootlessness and our restlessness. Think of Herman Melville, Walt Whitman, Arthur Miller, to name only a few from the literary field. I personally sense this turbulence characteristic. The American craftsman's work has reflected it. Yet individual craftsmen have reacted and expressed the American spirit in individual ways. I feel that the future holds the essence of our potentialities and agree with Walt Whitman in his quote from Democratic Vistas. 
I think I hear echoed from some mountaintop afar in the west the scornful laugh of the genius of these states. As a growing industrial nation with a mixed economy, I originally wrote in here mixed up economy, but decided that would be taken uh, uh, mistakenly. As a growing nation with a mixed economy, we immediately became swept up in the international phenomena of the Industrial Revolution. And I'll digress here to tell you a story. When I was designing for cabin crafts in Dalton, I was introduced by their president as Charles Counts, the young man who was just discovering the American Revolution. Because <laughs> uh, as you know, uh, we are involved. Revolution is the wrong word. It's, it is indeed an evolution. And in an America on the move, there was no chance to grow roots strongly in the old world culture. The experiment became the boldest in the form of government, and the democratic spirit he held dearly to certain power balances the separation of church and state, representational government, states' rights, local, as a southerner, I have to say states' rights, local autonomy, the inalienable rights assured the individual under the Constitution. This total political evolution has created the America that was then and is now because of such a past. In order to make relevant my feeling on the cultural forces, I like the priorities President John Adams listed in a letter to his wife, Abigail, in 1780. And here's his quote. The science of government, it is my duty to study more than all other sciences. The arts of legislation and administration and negotiation ought to take place indeed to exclude in a manner all the other arts. I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy geography and natural and naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. This quotation is helpful to me in communicating to you what I feel. First, President Adams suggests the federal government's continued policy in deferring in the arts. The arts of man, he seems to be saying, must be deferred until we can support ourselves in commerce and defend ourselves from the enemy. In Washington to this day, the Department of Defense and the Department of Commerce stand physically powerful to say nothing of their spiritual power manifested in the federal budget. The same is true with agriculture. Only when the arts and humanities legislation was passed in the mid-1960s Public Law 89-209, did we as Americans involve ourselves federally and officially in an equitable attempt to support the arts? That is, the government has maintained a hands-off policy in the arts. Through these years, the craftsman's product has been reflective of American cultural and economic development. As a small community-based businessman, the craftsman survived as long as he had the will to do so. In the region I know best, the Southern Highlands, for example, I could take you today to eight or ten pottery shops that have been in existence for five, sometimes six generations. A similar tradition holds true in weaving, in basketry, in woodcraft, in glass manufacture. Generally, however, the small production unit has become absorbed all over America by the surge toward total industrialization. This has been our way to progress, our American way to progress. Maybe it's the reality of our genius, and it's been a good thing. I do not want to project a feeling of disdain for business, the, the economy, and the GNP. Where the craftsman has been innovator, he has made a strong contribution to the industrial design of this country. I cite examples in the work of Gerbruder Thonet, he was an Austrian, but his bent wood style in furniture came to America and was absorbed. Richard Reimer Schmid, a German, whose designs were manufactured by the Dernbar Furniture Corporation in Indiana. Louis C. Tiffany, who made Art Nouveau an American concept too, especially through his designs for the Rookwood Pottery in Ohio. Marcel Bruyere, Bauhaus trained architect and designer who maintained a constant involvement in craftsmanship. 
Joseph Albers and his wife, the weaver, Annie Albers. And then I add the names of Charles Eames, Eero Saarinen, Mies van der Rohe, and you will know that I'm talking about architects to architects and not just about craftsmen. But we can draw no clear lines of distinction between architect and craftsman and craftsmanship and design anymore. But to, to be specifically crafts oriented, I should mention great American crafts names like Gertrude and Otto Nonsler, Marguerite Wildenhain, Evo Zeisel, Edwin and Mary Shire, Robert Turner in pottery, Ronald Pearson and John Pripp in metals, Trudy German Prey, Jack Larson and Glenn Kaufman in textiles, Sam Maloof, Wendell Castle, and Horton Esrick in wood. But these are only a few names, and there are many, many, many more. The crafts are the craft arts are very lively in our times. To summarize and maintain my chronological intent, we can say that the crafts have become international in style, as did the other arts, as did architecture. But the past is prologue, and as Carl Sandburg put it, a bucket of ashes. Let us face the present and think about the future. I think like architect Philip Johnson in his article in Look Magazine in January of this year, incidentally I saw a copy of it on the bulletin board and it did my heart good, the title, Architecture, a 20th Century Flop. Listen to Johnson. Our culture is not interested enough in environmental values to dedicate energy and wealth to architecture. Let no one say it is a financial problem. We have the money. We simply do not care enough to build architecture at all. Architecture is the creation of space for beauty and enjoyment. We have to build strictly for cheapness, for money-making, the simplest functionalist satisfactions. Architects are not hired for their art, but for their efficiency. Johnson, Philip Johnson's articulate voice is saying that modern architecture is a flop in the sense that we of the 20th century are a flop as a culture. He continues, the times, not only the art of building, are out of joint. We could paraphrase Johnson legitimately specifying crafts. I have felt that craftsmanship in America has been going in reverse instead of anything like in a positive, progressive direction. We have not taken seriously the challenge of abundance as voices like Robert Theobald and Philip Johnson say that we must. These are the voices and points of view that must be heard in every forum in the land. In our affluent society, we are supporting artists, architects, and designer craftsmen. But in our American tradition of deferment in cultural development and art education, we have not in the meanwhile really trained or created or manufactured new craftsmen. What few there are seem to emerge and strut fretfully for a few moments in something like a glory of success in spite of the system. I do not want to release a tirade on alienation, yet alienation is a fact, but it's a language of another day, a cause that has been lost in the space-time continuum. We are living in an era where everything is happening all at once, according to Marshall McLuhan, and because of man's electronic extensions, we will be creating an entirely new environment. Maybe the new environment will recreate us. The Dynamics of Change is the theme of a series of publications by the Kaiser Alumna Corporation, and in it they quote Robert, Robert Oppenheimer. The world is changing even as we walk in it. I remain at the same time angered and terrified at the kind of world we must in reality face. Recently, within a week ago, when I gave this same lecture, or gave the same slides I'm going to show you later, the opinion from the group was that it really must be fine to re retire to someplace like Rising Farm and escape the real problems that every man must face every day. As an independent agent in society, free and bound by it, I want to assure you, and that's why I wrote it down, I want to assure you that my personal solution is no escape. The rich in time or money have no escape from the poor in pocketbook or in spirit. As a nation, that which we would wish, wish to ideally be as individuals will be shaped by what we can become as a society. 
politically labeling a society great does not make it so. And sometimes we can agree with Thoreau who said, to be able to affect the quality of a day is the highest of the arts. At large, we agree with Whitman, there must be great audiences to have great poets. Today's American craftsman can choose he can become an individual, independent, interdependent studio workman, supplying objects for an expanding and expansive consumer market. He can design for industry, large, large-scale industry or small-scale. He can become a teacher in the growing market for teachers. Incidentally, the knowledge industry clear, clearly has become important in our economy. And there is an important role for the crafts trained person to serve the community, especially in the field of related social services, crafts in retirement, crafts in recreation, crafts for therapy. The American craftsman is in. We will have more and more and at the same time less and less. A craftsman is one who is involved in a media process. Within this concept, he can sell himself for all the infinitely varied ways any man can become a part of the society. If he has something really profound to say, to express with his craft media, he will simply express it. If with his craft involvement, he has anything really important to do, he will simply do it. He must choose. There is the vocation, the calling. There are the inner and outer needs of a man. And in the words of my college sociology professor, P.F. Ayer, if something needs to be done, and in the end it is not done, then you and I are among those who did not do it. The craftsman will be involved. The American craftsman as an individual will have a chance to become all that any individual has a chance to become in this rapidly changing world of ours. He will simply continue to be what he has always been, a producer of products that are all American, expressive of the era, the media, the methods of production, sometimes even the personal message of the man that was in the process of communicating. What he has to say is what he is as a human being in this real and unreal world. And so the American experiment continues. Now I'd like to continue my experiment with communication with having the lights out and the slide projectors on. So you bear with us for a minute or two. <clears throat> Don't anybody leave, please.
Richard really likes applause, and I don't like it, so I'll have Richard stand up and you can give him an applause. Let's say, as I said in the beginning, uh, you've given me equal time. Now, I'd like to give you equal time because what I cherish most is uh, some questions. So if you've got some questions, and there are plenty of questionable things that I've shown you, uh, I'd, I'd be glad to answer them. Right here. Where do, Where do I get my clay? Uh, well, like uh, most other craftsmen today, I dep depend on a supplier. For, for the first five years I was in business, I told people I dug it out from my basement. But uh, I just can't go ahead, go on telling that story. I, uh, clay, like any other raw material, is available now through a distributor. And what a craftsman does is test various clays. You can get a clay from California even. It's not too feasible, but it's possible and quite readily possible. Uh, and you can get clays from all over the place. M mainly, uh, there's a clay near you. That's what I tell people. There's a clay in your own backyard. And all you have to do is dig it and test it and fire it. And uh, you've got something to work with. Does that help you? More questions? Yes. Do they die their own yarn? Yes, we die for our customers is our motto. Do they die? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Artificial hide. Yes. Artificial hide. Yes. Artificial hide. Yes. Artificial hide. Yes. I showed you some slides of the traditional way of dyeing yarns. You remember uh, a basket with some beets and and various vegetables in there, sedge grass and, well, and that was no, that was writ, and I got it at the local grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the lo the natural dyes are really uh, quite obvious. They're very subtle and, and very beautiful, and it's very possible. One of the favorite colors is walnut ooze. Isn't that a lovely word? <laughs> and the first, the first dipping in walnut ooze is a very rich mahogany kind of brown. And if you keep dipping it and dipping it, it gets lighter and lighter until it becomes quite blonde. So, and it's very commonly available and it's very good. So just keep oozing with walnut and you've got it made. Anything that walnuts has is very beautiful. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the characteristic of that phenomenon is that people always did the best with what they had. And uh, a craftsman is trained to do very much with very little. And of course, the reason why most craftsmen like earlier peoples is because they, they had uh, very little to do with. And the, the contrast with our society is that we've got too much. We don't set any parameters on our, uh, on our design involvement because we've got too many things to choose from. And I won't go into that anymore, but I think you know what I mean. I want some more profound questions instead of how to do it. I'd be glad to tell you how to do it. You just do it. But uh, haven't I roused anybody to anything? Uh, yes? Uh, the oriental potter throws from the inside out, and the occidental potter throws from the outside in. Is that right? This is what I'm Something that was curious to me, the inside shape of the oriental potter always determines the outside shape as if the, the bottom of a vessel is, is curved so far on the outside of the vessel. And some of the pieces you have here, the it doesn't seem that the line of the inside always follows the line of the outside. Mm -hmm. Is this just a preference or a technique that you found more acceptable? Well, uh, you don't seem to think that the inside should kind of take the outside where yours don't seem to follow the well, 
the uh, best Oriental f uh, philosophy, uh, I mean, I always begin by telling my students that uh, I'm going to teach them the Western tradition in pot making and then proceed to quote somebody like Lao Tzu or somebody every other day. Uh, what we are, that's what I said in my earlier little comment, written comment, uh, what we are, we are. And of course, uh, in our day and time, we're, we're very involved and we'll become increasingly involved with every other culture as we all become uh, a global village, as Marshall McLuhan puts it more aptly. Uh, I don't think, I personally, I mean personally, I, I, I'm not an Oriental, and uh, I, don't, I don't think like they do. In fact, I don't even think at all when I make pottery. So whatever happens, happens because of my involvement sort of subconsciously with what I do. And I think the trouble with most young people, and I can say this because I'm over 33, uh, <laughs> is that they, they really are thinking too much and uh, uh, applying and not applying themselves really in the, in the practical kind of things. And this a craftsmanship involvement requires a depth involvement with all the senses. And I think your question is very, uh, I'll put it this way. I had a teacher once, his name was Mr. Kinoshigi, and he was a 77th generation master of the Zen pottery, came to this country and went around and did workshops. And he was an Oriental, of course, and he's Japanese. And, and I tried to understand him, and he spoke no English, so all we could do was grunts and groans. And uh, he gave a critique of the graduate student pots, and he sat there with his arms crossed. It seemed to me like 20 minutes, and he finally came through his interpreter these words, those pots uh, look very good, but they're not. <laughs> and your question, if you don't mind my being uh, rather bold about it and crude, your question is a very good one, but there's not an answer because uh, I just can't make an answer like that. Uh, I'd like to continue that dialogue though, by saying that, uh, by quoting Lao Tzu, uh, and I can't quote it correctly, but somebody, uh, it will remind you to look it up, and I will remind myself to look it up. But he starts out, and you've seen it, it's a famous quote, 30 spokes meet at the hub, and the essence of the spokes make the wheel, and it's the negative spaces that make the pot. And uh, so if you, if you can accept that as Oriental philosophy, you don't have to talk about inside or outside. You can look at all of it or, or nothing of it, and that's the essence of, uh, of, of the answer I'd give you on that just to begin. Uh, I read somewhere yesterday on the plane, flying around somewhere, that uh, <laughs> art, <laughs> art today is, is all the nothing. I mean, you know, how much can you leave out? It's the nothing that really makes art. It's always been true, of course. That's why we have something <laughs> called abstract. That means what's left out. <laughs> I was at Richard's early this morning about dawn, and and I found a non-door, the screen wasn't there, and so I thought that was a work <laughs> It was one of these doors with a screen, so that was non-art. And uh, I've given you a non-answer, and I'm sorry, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> I like those kind of questions because I can get turned on to them. Are there any more non-questions? So I can give you some more non-answers. <laughs> yes? Yes, uh, I guess that's the best answer is yes. I, li I like I like naked form, and that's why, why I like to uh, to work to live in the mountains because you see the variation in the season. I mean, you can see this time of year, uh, you can feel the bones of the mountain, so to speak. You know, it, it changes, and we have a cycle in the seasons. And I like cyclical things, and I like to see the uh, bare branch. I didn't know that I was influenced by trees until. Somebody told me and I thought about it and I wish I didn't even know it and just would just do it, but obviously the answer is yes. I mean, if I lived in uh, Indiana, I'm sure I'd just make flat pancake shapes with every once in a while. <laughs> that would be called something like a, a new harmony with, <laughs> with nature. In other words, I do think that the kind of environment we live in makes a 100% difference, especially if we're alive. <laughs> yes. I noticed that most of the uh, pottery and the textiles and everything else was quite colorful. And uh, I attribute to this to probably the area it was living in. Although the outside surroundings and everything was color in nature, uh, the buildings, 
and basically the atmosphere around it was neutral. And uh, have you ever tried reversing the cycle and, and taking it into a very colorful situation or a room or atmosphere and trying to do your pottery there and see what it comes out? Let's see now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I told uh, Dean Saffenfield, I gave him just very little advice and except about 20 pages worth on a telephone. And I said that, uh, please make the display look like a room because, I mean, the things that I make are not exhibition pieces like works of art or craft items meant to be used. And uh, the question you ask, I hope I'm answering it or I get the feeling of what you want to say. Uh, I try everything except that I believe that I use more color in textiles because uh, the, the pottery colors are really more subdued if you'll look closer. And I don't really have many brilliant colors in pottery because of the characteristic of the, the uh, temperature I fire my wear at. So I try to get more spectacular color uh, in the fabrics because I do need, I think that we need, uh, we need to work with a total spectrum. That's why I like the entranceway in this hall so much is because it reminds you of infinite possibilities as the spectrum does, not just with color, but with uh, the thought process. Uh, and I, I may, uh, I switch, you know, sometimes it's all neutral. And uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> does that help you? Does that answer your question well enough? No, not really. I was trying to, I was trying to find out <laughs> if there's a psychological relationship between the areas you're working in. I try, I try very hard not to think when I work. <laughs> I'm very serious about that. And, and that's a non-answer, but uh, I think that's our trouble. We're too cerebral, and we do need to be more visceral, and then get the cerebral and the visceral uh, working together so that you come out with something. And at the same time, I, I don't think an architect can be this way, because that would be a $200,000 mistake. <laughs> so, I mean, th there's quite a difference, isn't there? That's a, I mean, I, I, it's just a lot of clay that what I start with, and it's, it has no value at all. And so I can make all kinds of mistakes, and that's why I, uh, I'm not an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I flunk math. <laughs> not really, but that's besides the point, too. Okay, did, did I answer you? I, I mean, I'll continue if, you, if you'll continue. We'll leave it right there. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's buried, though, does it? Community. I mean, how do you get the community involved? I mean, the um, people. I, I really, uh, I really don't think there's any problem with uh, getting the community involved. Uh, and I'll say this, and I hope I'm not misunderstood, and I probably shouldn't say it, but the last line in King Lear say, "Speak what you feel, and not what you ought to say." Uh, somebody said recently that the strangest thing about our society is that we were afraid to touch each other. And it's a popular song out called something about he touched her perfect body with his mind. And uh, the, th the thing that I'm trying to say here, and not to be uh, risque or sexy, <laughs> but is the fact that people are afraid to get involved with each other on a basic human level, human to human situation. And we seem to build islands against each other. And, and my feeling is that everybody is a craftsman and everybody has a chance to, uh, to get involved and participate on some level, regardless if he's six months or six weeks or, you know, the whole chronological development. And um, uh, there's just no problem in getting involved with the community. All you have to do is have some yarn and, and a, a rug frame and say, go to hooking. And they go to putting colors together and that's involvement. That's involvement with people and process. And if I were teaching a, a workshop course, you would be involved instantly in a piece of paper and a pencil or a wad of clay and an argument, if nothing else. So uh, th this business of involvement is, uh, I think, the key word. And uh, uh, we just got to be involved. That's all. Yes. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. I wanted to tell you about that. I, I made a promise with myself that I wouldn't carry on a, wor a verbal dialogue with the pictures because I tried this last time, and it was disastrous, and the meeting went on for three hours. And uh, so I just showed you, the, but I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to tell you about it. That was made by a 75-year-old lady in West Virginia. And I got my uh, cycle 
if my carousel mixed up or you would have seen West Virginia and sort of related it, but it doesn't matter. Things go backwards and forwards in our day and time anyway. But that, that rug was made uh, uh, by a 75-year-old lady who had no art training at all, except she was very involved. You know, as you said, community involvement. How do you get community involved? She was very involved, and I think it's a magnificent expression. It's, uh, she took those little pieces of fabric and she padded them, like quilting. It's like a quilt, but it's a rug. And it's about a three by five rug, and uh, the little black areas around it are just ordinary mercerized cotton that have been whipped and whipped and whipped till it builds up a little cloisonne kind of thing. Yes, it did. And some of the pieces, for example, were as rough as uh, corduroy. And some were, it was very durable, and it, uh, it was very functional in that you didn't trip over it. Was, it had a sturdy quality to it. And I think it was one of those phenomena that just happened. I could have bought it for $45 and didn't have the money, but I sold it to the Smithsonian instead for about $75. So. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, she's quite, a, quite, a, quite an, uh, this is what I would call a primitive folk craftsman that we have a lot of in Muncie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was one of mine, probably. <laughs> I was flattered. <laughs> oh, I, I like that word, uh, simple. In fact, the characteristic of uh, mountaineers is that they're simplistic, whatever that means. I like uh, the essence of things. That's why I like the bare mountain, the bare you know, confrontation of questions. I want some more. Are there any more? <clears throat> I don't want to belabor it, but I'm will. Yes, right here, this young man with the glasses. How involved are these craftsmen with the world outside of there? So involved. Very involved. Does that answer you? Uh, and I'd like to discuss it a little bit more if I can get on your train of thought. I mean, uh, you mean how, how are they reacting to change and that sort of thing? I mean, do, do they have any feelings towards world issues? or? Yeah, they all hate the war in Vietnam, if that's what you want to know. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, uh, they, 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 all, uh, they always have opinions. Everybody has an opinion of their own, if you can get down to it. Uh, they're involved, yes, with the world situation and uh, uh, with other issues. And they know that things are happening. They just sometimes are uh, not able to participate fully uh, in something that we might want them to participate in, like just being. Just, you know what I mean? Just just being or the, the, the sad thing, uh, I missed a whole section of slides, uh, those pine knot slides. I did a 27 week training program last winter in Kentucky and I had people in my class, uh, I had some 70, you know the boy and girl there that were always together, you know, and not making pottery but they were involved. <laughs> uh, these kind of people are, are people that that have been on welfare, on the welfare rolls. Uh, their fathers were on welfare, so to speak, and they were unemployed. Uh, people that the town had left them, I mean, the industry had gone, but they were still there. And uh, uh, what, was I, what was I going to tell you? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, yes. The thing that I'm concerned about, obviously, is that they still, they still respond some way in a positive kind of way. I mean, they still get involved in crafts and not produce so many children who will then be on welfare, but who will uh, still be people. And I think people naturally will, will uh, make hook rugs and, and draw pictures and communicate with each other in a creative way if they have a chance, except that in a way we've destroyed their ability to get involved with, a, with um, everyday things because we've, we've tried to force them into a system that they cannot participate in as people. And that's a lot of sociological language and I haven't come through clearly on it. But does that help any? Okay, there were two more questions. Well, how, how do you contact these people is what I'm trying to get at. I mean, I just, ha I just see them, I see them like I'm seeing you. I just see them with her, I just have eyeball contact <laughs> with them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't go out looking for anybody. <laughs> I mean, I, it's sort of against my nature. Uh, 
Oh, that's an important question, and I like, I like to give it the answer a little dignity, uh, if I can. Uh, you know, I don't know how to answer it, though. I mean, uh, how do you? I don't go out looking for them. Somebody asked me to uh, to come up and teach a 27-week training program, or somebody somebody else who's interested in people. You know that little quotation I gave you from my sociology professor? He says, if we can define something that needs to be done, and in the end it isn't done, then we're the ones who didn't do it. And uh, somebody's always out doing good. And uh, uh, Stuart Udall said we didn't need any more do-gooders. What we needed was some good doers. <laughs> and uh, I can uh, subscribe to that. And uh, somebody is interested in people, and uh, this is how the contact is made. I think that's the best answer I can give that. Give to that. And uh, I showed a lot of pictures of children, especially uh, some so-called culturally deprived children. Remember the, boy, the little boy in the uh, truck seat with the springs. Uh, my point of view is that we must begin uh, very, very young. I mean, the psychiatrists are telling us that it, it's already happened by the time a child's born in terms of personality development, or at least in the first six days, if not the first six years. So if we're going to make contact with people, we're going to have to start developing uh, people to be people as early as possible. But there's no time ever that's too late. I've worked with 60-year-old people and 16 and 36-year-old people, so the contact should be made as early as possible and continued throughout life. <clears throat> Are there more questions? Yes. Well, that's a good. You, you want to talk about the wage in our law and that sort of thing? I mean, is it economically viable? And that that is that what you want? Is that well, the question? No, I'm about getting together. Oh, getting them together. We'll put up a quilting frame. That's the best way to get them together. Uh, or. Uh, how, in a rural area, do you get people together for training? Is that is it something like that? No. Yeah. Well, now that's uh, your, your point. I think the question that you're raising, and I'd like to answer, is that. Uh, I think that people who have a, the opportunity to get design training have a, a certain responsibility to go back to the grassroots and make sh and get get where the action is, where people need the kind of involvement that people have on a sophisticated level. For example, when I talked about uh, cerebral training, I didn't mean to be knocking schools and education because I'm all for it, but I think that the cycle should be that one gets educated and then goes back and generates interest in the total society. And that I feel strongly that uh, only well-trained uh, designers, artists, craftsmen, and designers, whichever one word you want to select, should be working with, uh, with people. But this is an ideal statement. And uh, I would compromise by saying people should work with people. Does that, does that help you? That's a left-handed answer, but I, I don't always come through loud and clear. Are there, yes? Um, would you say that most of the products that these people made are bought or used in some way? I mean, are they uh, stacked up somewhere and not being bought? No. Or are they uh, moving pretty well? Uh, they're moving quite well. Uh, there's an old German, if you don't mind me referring to Westerns, there's an old German quotation that says, uh, if it is made, somebody wants it. And even the, the frilliest little, uh, what's that funny word that you put on the back of uh, sofas? It's a funny word that Ruben Hill always says and I can't ever say, but that's right. <laughs> I can't even repeat it, but <laughs> I'll say doily. Uh, even, even the, the uh, frilliest of, uh, you know, uh, kind of involvement is wanted if somebody has made it. And I think in an automated society that that's even going to be more significant. If somebody has made it 
than somebody wants it. And it's just as simple and as direct as that. And uh, I, I believe that. I'm a true believer in that concept. Somebody started to stick their hand up and they didn't. We were just lighting a cigarette. Okay. Are there more questions? Yes. Well, uh, there are no longer any backwood craftsmen in America. Uh, and for, I'm really sorry that there aren't. Everybody has been discovered. But <laughs> the, uh, uh, the char uh, a characteristic of uh, what we might ideally call a backwood craftsman, which is what I am, incidentally, is uh, that, no, we don't want to have to punch the time clock. We're living in a free society. Why shouldn't we act as free men? And by golly, if I want to go fishing, I'll just go fishing. And I'll accept the responsibility of the consequence. And uh, I think that's what it means to be, to be alive and uh, to live in an affluent society. Of course, we have responsibilities that we don't have to sell ourselves to a, a certain kind of system where we, we can't be uh, very human. And uh, uh, John Cage always says that the sound of silence is, is it, you know, I mean, it's the negative spaces again in life, or when you just sit down to, to do nothing, that's when it really happens. I mean, that's when you really become yourself and those ideas start flowing. So uh, if we had a backwoods craftsman or a backwoods type person, as Thoreau was a backwoodsman, uh, I think that wouldn't be too bad. But I'm not saying it's for everybody. <laughs> Does that help you? Okay. Are there more questions? I love to talk, obviously. <laughs> yes? Uh, working as closely as you do with these people, can you see any way that uh, someone or a community as far away as Muncie, Indiana, for instance, could help these people? Yes, uh, thank you. That's one of my favorite questions. Uh, the best kind of, I judged a craft show this week in uh, Winter Park, Florida, and if anything ever was affluent society, Winter Park is, and uh, there were 700 artists and craftsmen, sculptors entered this, and uh, about 100,000, and after the her hun first 100,000 people came, it doesn't matter, there might have even been 200,000. After the, the public came, the thing that most, in, in order to answer your question and relate it to that, the thing that's most important in the process of manufacture is that there is a response from something like a consumer. And too often we consider uh, just, I would say, my first candid answer would say, the way you can help is just to buy it. <laughs> But I, I want to be a little bit more uh, soft on that because uh, the best answer, of course, if it, if it is important to the maker, then it has already had enough importance. But on the other hand, uh, I used the quote from Whitman in my uh, calculated speech. And uh, in order to, in order to uh, have great poets, you've got to have uh, a great audience. And in order to have great craftsmen, or really good craftsmen, you've got to have a really enthusiastic consuming public. And the very best uh, way Muncie, Indiana could help would be to just look and find and buy it. That's the best kind of encouragement for the, for the craftsman. And often, it's a very simple thing. Uh, Richard was just telling me that he had discovered a, a backwoods craftsman, if you'll excuse me, there really are a few left, not many. Uh, a man who made baskets, uh, really beautiful baskets. They're 17th century baskets still being made in a few places. And he wanted 250 for them, 250 each. Someday in the Smithsonian, they'll be valued at maybe $25 or maybe even $250. The point is that they really are priceless. And the ultimate point is that if you want to help, just learn how to recognize quality and genuine human beauty when you see it and grab it quicker than I grabbed that beautiful, uh, that beautiful rug, you know, the flower power rug. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll give up if you will. Thank you very much.